But now that Malcolm is presented as the next king, you can see that satanic reaction in Macbeth. I say satanic because uh, this was the same kind of feeling that Satan might have felt when God nominated his son as the successor. Hello and welcome back to the Macbeth classes on Nibble Pop. In the previous video, we have covered the first three scenes of Act 1. And in today's video, I am going to take you through the fourth scene of Act 1. Pay very close attention to the whole video because I am going to deal with the lines extensively, give you the meanings and the explanations of very important aspects which you need to understand to understand the future course of action in the play. The scene takes place in Forest, that is the capital of Duncan, and we see him interacting with his lords. Macbeth comes along with Banco, and we will see how the conversation goes and what happens, which will have a great impact on the things which will happen in future. So let's begin the scene. In the second scene, we had seen that the existing Thane of Coder, he had betrayed the king and because of that execution was ordered, like he was supposed to be killed by the state. And here Duncan is inquiring about uh, whether that execution is complete, whether the Thane of Coder is dead or not. And he says, is execution done on Coder? Or not those in commission yet returned. So commission means here the people who were in charge of overseeing that the Thane of Coder he is killed by the royal order. Malcolm, Duncan's son, he replies, My liege, they are not yet come back. Now notice that Malcolm is addressing his father as my liege and he is not saying, you know, dad or father or any such thing. This is because this is an official setting, right? Because he is now in his court room and he is surrounded by the nobles and other lords. And therefore, Malcolm has to maintain certain protocols where he will address his father as the king. So he is using the expression my liege or which means my lord. And he informs him that the people who were in charge of the Thane of Coder's execution, they had not yet returned. But I have spoke with one that saw him die. So the Thane of Coder is dead for sure. Who did report that very frankly, he confessed his treason. So the Thane of Coder, he had confessed his guilt, implored your highness's pardon and he sought forgiveness and set forth a deep repentance. So whenever a criminal is charged uh, to a sentence, then if that criminal confesses the guilt, seeks forgiveness, it is believed that justice has been served because it actually proves that the king is right in serving him that particular sentence. Nothing in his life became him like the leaving it. Now, when you use the word leaving on stage, you do not actually tell people the spelling, right? So it is very much similar to the word living. So here is a contrast established. What kind of contrast? See, the Thane of Coder, he lived his life not in an appropriate way, right? He betrayed the trust of the king. But in his death, in his leaving his life and not living, in leaving his life, he is acting in an honorable manner. And this is why Malcolm says that he becomes more honorable in the way he died than he was while he lived. He died as one that had been studied in his death. So studied here means he showed the kind of properness in the way he accepted death. It 
showed as if he had practiced the art of dying almost. To throw away the dearest thing he owed. When we die, we throw away our life, right? We throw away our bodies in a way. And this is what Malcolm refers to here. As it were a careless trifle. Now, this image of dress, this image of clothing keeps on repeating itself in this play. And we will see how uh, life, honor, additional responsibilities, these are often compared to garments which a person wears. And this is very similar to the Hindu concept of this body being a garment which you wear. Duncan feels that the pain of Corder and his actions disturbed him so much that he somehow lost faith in people and he understood that it is not possible for somebody to judge someone else merely by appearance, merely by what they say. And he says, there is no art to find the mind's construction in the face. There is no art means there is no technique to understand what is going on in somebody's mind simply by looking at someone's face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. So he feels bad that the Thane of Coder, who had been pretty close to him, we see that, had betrayed him and that broke his trust. But will this be a lesson for him? Will this make him a more prudent person, a more careful person? Or will he not learn his lessons? before it is too late. And just when he uses this expression that he built his trust on this gentleman, the ex thane of Goder, who enters the present thane of Goder, that is Macbeth. Shakespeare plays with these exits and entrances. He somehow gives a kind of a foreboding and he knows that these Exits and entrances, they are vital pointers to character development, to the development of plot and to ensure that the audience, they get the correct message. All right. So we will see that Shakespeare does not use a lot of stage directions, does not. He simply gives you the exits and entrances. He gives you uh, some soliloquy or asides, but he does not give you stage directions as elaborately as George Bernard Shaw does or maybe John Osborne does. He believes in the freedom of the characters, the freedom of the director. And in a way, he was not writing his plays. He was actually producing them. So he probably gave the instructions directly to the actors while they were being performed and before they were being performed. Anyway, so we see Macbeth, Banco, Ross, Angus, they all come and Duncan is seen as this welcoming king and he expresses his gratitude to Macbeth because Macbeth had won this war for him and he says, O oh, worthiest cousin. So Macbeth is not just a subject or not just a general under him, it's not just a thing, but he's also related to him and he calls him cousin. The sin of my ingratitude even now was heavy on me. Now you will see that Duncan is extremely modest, over humble you can say and he goes on trying to convince everybody that uh, no matter how much he rewards Macbeth, he will always fall short that Macbeth deserves far more than Duncan can ever give. He does not realize that by doing this, by being so informal about his appreciation, he is somehow airing a sinister ambition that might be lurking here and there in Macbeth's mind. Oh, worthiest cousin, the sin of my ingratitude. So I'm so ungrateful because I have rewarded you. And now I realize that that reward is nothing compared to what you have done. So I am ungrateful. 
that swiftest wing of recompense recompense when you compensate something when you give something in return of something so macbeth has done something for the king and the king has decided to recompense him but the swiftest wing of recompense is slow to overtake thee so no matter how much i try to recompense you it will always fall short of expectation or it will fall short of reaching the height of service which you have provided would thou had less deserved if you were less deserving i would have felt good because then my compensation would have been good now all these things are mere words of course he doesn't want to say that if macbeth had served him less if macbeth had lost the war then he would have been happy no nothing like that it is just a way of expressing his enormous gratitude and it also shows how good hearted the king is because usually Uh, while we see other people are speaking in such a formal uh, in a restricted manner we see the king he is not holding himself back only i have left to say more is thy due than more than all can pay now he constantly repeats himself that he is not sure whether any payment is good enough for macbeth's service macbeth who is very formal in his reply does reply appropriately and he says the service and the loyalty i owe in doing it pays itself which means that you don't have to bother about payment the moment i serve you that act of serving you itself is very rewarding and therefore you don't have to think about payment you don't have to think about reward because serving you is a reward in itself so he tries to match the enthusiasm of the king but we see that Macbeth who is of course disturbed by certain other thoughts in his mind which the king doesn't know of is not very expressive in front of the king as much as the king is and he speaks about his duties not about emotions not about love here but duties and what does he say your highness's part is to receive our duties your work is not to pay us but to receive our duties and our duties are to your throne and state children and servants which do but what they should by doing everything safe toward your love and honor so our work is to protect everything that adds to your glory and that itself is like a payment for us duncan now shifts his attention to banco banco is always the you know second citizen you can say in case of uh, the witches we saw that they addressed banco after they prophesied uh, things for macbeth and here we see that duncan also greets banco after he had finished talking about macbeth and this this way of treating a character as secondary is also uh, seen in many other cases many other plays by shakespeare and i will later on discuss maybe when i'll be discussing banco in detail in some separate video uh, here i just want to use the word and want you to remember this word foil foil is another character not the main character or the hero another character who is presented as a parallel character but somehow of secondary importance so in banco's case we'll see that banco serves as a foil to macbeth foil does not mean inferior in any way foil means secondary so far as the play is concerned so far as the uh, you can say importance given to characterization is concerned okay so remember this word foil when you are thinking about banco duncan welcomes banco uh banco also replies with uh, gratitude and then duncan makes a very important announcement he says my plenteous joys wanton in fullness so i'm full of joy now seek to hide themselves in drops of sorrow so he is so happy that he's almost weeping and then he announces sons kinsmen thanes and you whose place are the nearest so he is surrounded uh, by his sons and people of his court no we will establish our estate upon our eldest malcolm this is important because when shakespeare was writing macbeth at that time 
monarchy was a hereditary thing in England, which meant that the son or daughter of the king or the queen becomes the next king or queen automatically. But during the time of Macbeth's reign or during the time uh, about which Shakespeare is writing, at that time, monarchy was not hereditary. The king or queen, mostly the king, we don't have concepts of queen back then, the king nominated the next king from among his noblemen, from among his children, and then that person became the king after the existing king died. This is important because had monarchy been hereditary, then Macbeth wouldn't have felt that it was possible for him to become a king because he was not the king's son. But because kingship was actually something which was given to someone and was not necessarily hereditary, so Macbeth had these hopes of becoming the king. But this announcement went against all his hopes. Maybe somewhere deep down he had this feeling that he had served him so well that Duncan would nominate him as the next king. You know, he said that if fate uh, wanted to crown me, then it would do it without my stirring. That meant that he felt that maybe Duncan would nominate him to be the next king and he would automatically become it. He doesn't have to kill anybody for that. But now that Malcolm is presented as the next king, you can see that satanic reaction in Macbeth. I say satanic because uh, this was the same kind of feeling that Satan might have felt when God nominated his son as the successor or next in power. And Duncan decides to name Malcolm the Prince of Cumberland, which is like the official position of the person who would succeed the king, right? Upon our eldest Malcolm, whom we name hereafter the Prince of Cumberland, which honor must not unaccompanied invest him only. So it is not that I'm going to honor him only. I'm also going to honor everybody who is present here because Duncan is a gracious king and he believes in distribution of power somehow. But signs of nobleness like stars shall shine. So nobles are compared to stars, whereas Malcolm is the sun, of course. Uh, and that pun is almost intended here. On all deservers. So whoever deserves to be honored will be honored today along with my son Malcolm. From hence to Inverness. And now he invites himself to Macbeth's palace. Somehow he feels that he needs to go there, uh, spend some time at Macbeth's castle and bind us further to you. And he wishes to you know, develop this relationship with Macbeth somehow. Macbeth is again official, formal in his replies. The rest is labor which is not used for you. So he is trying to be uh, you know, very humble about his duties towards the king and says that whenever he is resting and not serving the king, this is actually labor. And whenever he serves the king, does something for him, that is like rest for him. I'll be myself the harbinger and make joyful the hearing of my wife with your approach. Harbinger means one who is passing the message. So he decides to go before the king arrives or leaves so that he can inform his wife about the arrival of the king. So humbly take my leave. He leaves. Uh, he doesn't leave the stage. He takes leave of the king. And Duncan is very happy. He says, my worthy corder. And then a very important aside by Macbeth. The Prince of Cumberland. That is a step on which I must fall down. So this is like a setback for him. Or else overleap. So either I must accept this, step down, or I must challenge this, overcome this. For in my way it lies. It's like a block in my way. Stars hide your fires. Immediately before this, the, the stars are used as 
you know, nobility. So here he wants the stars to hide their fires, which means he wants no witnesses. He wants to associate himself with nobody else. And he wants the stars to hide their fires because stars also represent the angelic forces which oversee human action. He doesn't want to be seen by anything divine. So he wants the stars to shut themselves. Let not light see my black and deep desires. He knows that his ambition is black. It is deep. It is deep rooted in his heart and he does not want it to be revealed to anybody. The eye wink at the hand. There is a constant dichotomy between the eye and the hand in case of Macbeth and in many tragic uh, heroes we find this dichotomy. I mean something which you see, which you approve of in yourself. All right? And hand is something which you do. So when you are going through a conflict in yourself, your eye does not want to see what you are doing, which means it does not approve of the actions which you are taking place on. Which means it does not approve of your actions. So he knows that the eye winks at the hand. Wink means it you know, looks askance. It, it does not look directly. It does not want to see what he is doing. Yet let that be. So I don't care what my eye thinks or sees. Which the eye fears when it is done to see. So I don't care. I just care that something which I have planned must be done which is too scary for me to see or approve of. Macbeth leaves Duncan still there on stage with his companions and he says, True worthy Banco, he is full so valiant. So he speaks in flowery terms, not just in front of Macbeth, but when he is not on stage as well. So we understand that this feeling for Macbeth is very genuine in the king and in his commendations I am fed it is a banquet to me let's after him whose care is gone before to bid us welcome it is a peerless kinsman kinsman means again the relative of the king or in this case because Macbeth is cousin of Duncan so he is referring to him as the kinsman he wants to go to Macbeth's castle wants to make this bond stronger but what he doesn't realize is that his previous thain of Coder, who had broken his trust was only a premonition to what Macbeth is going to do. Duncan refuses to learn the lesson, the one lesson of kingship that could have saved him the lesson of caution. He decided to trust Macbeth excessively and somehow he failed to realize that for the king of Scotland, the Thane of Gordor was always, always going to be the nemesis. As we have gone through this scene very meticulously, we have realized that this scene has two most important junctures. One where we find that the king announces the successor Malcolm which has repercussions on Macbeth. And the second point is where the king decides to go and visit Macbeth's palace or castle, which is going to have repercussions in future. So these are the two points on which the scene hinges or you can say uh, supports itself. And these are the two important things which you must remember from this scene, which you will require in next scenes to come. Okay, so thank you for being with me for so long and I really hope to be with you very soon with the next scene which is going to be a very vital scene and is going to be a very important scene so far as characterization is concerned. I hope you have enjoyed today's class. Do tell me in the comment section if you have found anything difficult in this scene. Hope to see you all very soon again. Stay subscribed, stay happy. Bye-bye.